Welcome to Care Partners Compass, Navigating CRC. My name is Elsa Lankford. I am the care partner to my incredible wife, Christine, who has stage four colorectal cancer. As a disclaimer, this podcast and its content is for entertainment purposes only. The views and opinions expressed by any hosts or guests on this podcast are their own personal opinions. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation. This podcast does not contain medical or legal advice. Please consult your medical professional about any medical questions or concerns. In today's episode, and in a few of the episodes, I am joined by my friend Annie Dolores. She's been a patient advocate for CRC for almost seven years. She's very involved in colorectal cancer and KRAS social media groups and communities. She selflessly shares her wisdom and research at conferences and online. Before I do an episode on the second kind of chemo that Christine did, it's important to talk about biomarkers, what they are, and why they're important. Cancer is essentially a series of genetic changes that allow some cells to keep growing and multiplying. These changes can be from a combination of errors, damage, and they can be inherited. Biomarkers are the combination of mutations in the tumor. There can be many different combinations of biomarkers. Even for people with the same kind of cancer, there can be variations. Some chemo, immunotherapy, or clinical trials are available only for particular biomarkers. That's why you want to know your loved one's biomarkers, to understand the options. At Christine's diagnosis, I thought cancer was cancer. Just like the human body, cancer is incredibly complex. Not only are the different kinds of cancers unique, but two people with colon cancer, the same age, gender, everything the same, they can have incredibly different biomarkers. The tumor will have its own set of mutations, and then there can be person-specific inherited mutations as well. Those get passed down from your family and can be passed down from you to your family. This episode is going to get a little sciencey as Annie stops by again to be a guest on the podcast as she is a true expert in certain biomarkers. As you'll hear in this episode, it took me a while to know what Christine's were, and that was fine. This is a, a journey where your brain needs to be ready <laughs> for all of the information and all of uh, everything. If learning scientific information is not for you, then hopefully you can find somebody to add to the care partners circle that will help you be able to do some research. There's going to be another episode, probably more than one episode, about some ways to get started researching. I did want to do a little background on CRC. There are three categories of how people get colorectal cancer. The first is called sporadic. That means there's not a family history of that cancer or an inherited DNA gene mutation that would increase the risk. Sporadic is 50 to 60% of CRC cases. Familial happens 30 to 40% of the time. And what that means is that somebody in your family had or has colorectal cancer, which makes you more likely to get it. Their family members should be screened 10 years before the age of diagnosis. Hereditary is 4 to 6 percent. Most of us know when we hear about BRCA genes that we think about certain cancers like breast cancer. Scientists and researchers are starting to get a better sense of these mutations that increase the risk of CRC for people. Let's talk about some of the main biomarkers in CRC. Yeah. Um, So almost 50 percent of colorectal cancer uh, has either a KRAS mutation, which is about 45% of all CRC patients, or an NRAS mutation, which I guess is about 2 to 4%. And then there's a BRAF mutation, which is about 8 to 10%. There's a HER2 mutation amplification, which is about 2 to 4%. It's more common in rectal cancer patients, like one out of seven rectal cancer patients have a HER2 mutation. And then there's fusion, uh, like NTRAC. So it when you take all of those away, you have about 40% who are KRAS wild, which means they have no mutation, BRAF wild, uh, NRAS wild. And so 
they have the option in a their first or second line if they're stage four of having an EGFR inhibitor, uh, such as cetuximab, panitimumab. And they even have the option of rechallenging it down the road. It looks like it, they might still get additional benefit for trying it again. So I'm going to hit pause here for one second because in the first edit I did of this podcast, Christine listened to it and she wrote down in all caps, slow it down and explain to your mother. So first, hi mom. So the different biomarkers that Annie mentioned are likely going to be on a report somewhere. If you don't have that information, ask your oncologist. It's probably in the pathology report, a basic version of it, but there might have been other tests as well that have these biomarkers. If your loved one is stage 4 CRC, then they're probably MSS, microsatellite stable. MSS means that they're still working in clinical trials and research to find the best ways to get immunotherapy to work. Sometimes MSS CRC tumors are called cold because it's harder for the immune system to see that they don't belong and to go after them. Future episode alert will be on the immunotherapy trial that Christine is on. One biomarker that wasn't mentioned that you'll see a lot in CRC is APC. Christine is MSS. She has multiple APC mutations and is KRAS wild which means her tumor does not have the KRAS mutation. But none of those words meant anything to us at diagnosis and even for a few months after. MSI, microsatellite instability, is 15% in the earlier stages. So 15% altogether, maybe 10% in stage two and three, and then it goes down to 4% in stage four. And partly it's because the cancer cells are actually easier for our immune system to recognize. And that that's why immunotherapy works. They actually uh, have their own immune regulation going on, their own immune surveillance. If you are stage one, two, or three, and you have microsatellite instability, at a certain point, it can be a comfort to know, okay, if I do have recurrence, there is an immunotherapy option. And immunotherapy can be curative or very long, durable responses in the stage four setting. What kind of information is out there for people who have HER2 mutations? If you have a HER2 mutation, uh, there's an international mountain near trial phase three that offers first line HER2 targeted treatment that uh, it's already offered in the second line. Can you just get people to understand that it's not going to say HER2 on the report? It's going to say HERB2. E-R-R-B or E-R-B-B-2. And that's because of the way that science uh, does their nomenclature. What about people who have BRAF mutations? If you have BRAF, microsatellite stability, there is a breakwater trial in the first line. I mean, honestly, if you have a BRAF mutation, it's it could be very aggressive. So finding an expert with BRAF if you're uh, stage 3C is a really good idea because you want to have people who are absolutely aware of all your options and can put you into the best uh, one that they can recommend for you. It's already hard enough a diagnosis, especially with stage 4. Usually the first step is going to be chemo, but with certain biomarkers, there are now first-line clinical trials. What that means is that if you know your loved one's biomarkers already, they are testing out if an experimental drug or an experimental drug with chemo might be a possible better option than chemo to start. There, there are trials that are opening up in the first line. Right now, a first line uh, KRAS, NRAS trial called Advancertib, uh, the FDA actually is reviewing this drug and they made the recommendation. It seems to work better. People who haven't tried uh, bevacizumab yet. And so we are recommending you move it to the first line so you can find more people who are eligible for the trial. There was research at uh, ASCO June 2023 that for early onset patients who have high TMB, they might actually have a pole mutation. And people with pole mutations can actually... Uh, get immunotherapy in the stage four setting, maybe even in the stage three setting if they're at an NCI setting. So it's this 
interesting kind of combination of information, what's actionable, what's not actionable, what's even understandable. There's always a value of going to uh, an expert. What should someone with a KRAS mutation be aware of? So I think you have to understand that your biology is going to be different than someone else's. There might be averages. You might want to find a KRAS expert. There's a KRAS revolution going on. There's dozens and dozens of trials, definitely in KRAS G12C, which is about 2%, but also uh, about 33% of KRAS patients have G12D. It's even higher in other cancers. And then there's uh, G12V, and then there's G12R, there's G13D. There's many of these uh, different mutations. I mean, we need to get more information about this, but we need to like not uh, let ourselves get so scared that we aren't proactive. Right now, there's so many targeted treatments for BRAF, for two for KRAS and NRAS that knowing your mutation is a really good idea. The KRAS G12C is now in the NCCN guidelines for CRC, for colorectal cancer. In 2020, a friend of mine was the third person on the Marathi trial in colorectal cancer. So it's now four, five years later, and it's now part of the guideline. Um, but she was able to get benefit for herself and, um, by doing the trial to like start learning about it uh, early in your disease or have somebody in your life learn early in the disease process so that you have a certain level of comfort versus having to learn it all at once. And the other caveat is that surgery is more important than mutational targeted treatments in general. So that's the thing is like you want to figure out how do you get to surgery because that's the potentially curative option in CRC. So how do you shrink the tumor? How do you get to the point where the surgeon considers you eligible? I remember the date because when I look in my Google photos to remind myself of her list of biomarkers, I look for February 1st, 2022. So like six months after her initial diagnosis was the first time that I had her biomarkers. And this kind of is like a showing my learning curve too. I was developing the ability to look into them more. So some people that are care partners or patients that like start going into this, um, you know, searching for information and, and working with information, like right at the very beginning of the diagnosis, I'm kind of amazed because it really, it, it took me a bit to wrap my head around. I needed to find out what I didn't know. <laughs> I think also... I, I totally uh, see where you're coming from. Five years ago, like, are you? do you have a KRAS or NRAS or BRAF mutation or your KRAS, BRAF, NRAS, WILD, which for people listening, WILD is the way scientists say that there's no mutation. So if you were KRAS, NRAS, BRAF, WILD, uh, you, you had the ability to do an EGFR inhibitor, cetuximab or panitumumab. But if you had the other mutations, you couldn't do it. I think you did like what you guys did of, of focusing on the best treatment, getting to the best doctors is actually like the most important first line thing because you have to take care of yourself. And does it help to, you know, to be thinking about KRAS when you're first uh, diagnosed that there's nothing to do, but things have changed. Like there is a first line KRAS G12C trial, which is like 2% of patients, but I think the problem is in is in these uh, NGS next generation sequencing reports. Like some of them, like they'll talk about what's actionable, but over and over again, you see these reports that are sort of difficult to understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and they're all in different formats. I mean, technically, we have you know the pathology report, the Signatera mutation list. She has a Tempest report that listed stuff that the Signatera didn't list. So it's in different formats. Some of them look for different things. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, and also that, you know, it over time, it's something that if it turns out that something is inherited, you'll want to know for your family for testing. The most common inherited mutations are Lynch, which, you know, most people get tested for that in stage four 
I mean, there's millions of people with Lynch syndrome in the U.S. And like, if you diagnose one person with Lynch syndrome, their entire family can then actually help themselves be less at risk and do, you know, more screening, more preventative actions. Definitely. So I know for stage four, it should be done. Is it standard of care for it to be done at any stage? Do you know? To test for biomarkers? It was part of the NCCN guidelines to be tested at stage four. It's recommended at all stages. It's now part of the guidelines that stage three rectal cancer patients get tested to see if they have microsatellite instability. Because if they do, the guidelines now has another uh, immunotherapy option that they can try out. There are people who are getting to NED, no evidence of disease on immunotherapy. For stage three rectal, it's only about 3% of the patients. But for those 3%, um, immunotherapy might be a way to avoid surgery. Hopefully that was a helpful intro to biomarkers and colorectal cancer. It might take some time to understand your loved one's cancer more, and that is completely normal. Getting as much information as you can about it is really helpful. That might mean multiple tumor reports. I would highly suggest, even if the cancer doesn't look like it's inherited, getting a genetic test done as well. There's constantly new information and research that's out there. So getting up-to-date reports might have new biomarkers, mutations, deletions, things that wouldn't have been on a test run by the same company even just a couple of years ago. If you're interested in learning more about your loved one's cancer, I'm going to have a future episode about how to do some basic research at home and also about clinical trials. If nothing else comes out of this podcast, then I hope it's that more people get colonoscopies, that people understand how to communicate with people who have cancer, and to talk about your family's medical history. You know, just get your family talking about it. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Care Partners Compass, Navigating CRC. Please listen up for the next episode, which will come out next week. If you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app, you'll know exactly when the next episode comes out. I hope that you'll share the podcast with your friends and family. The transcript of Care Partners Compass, Navigating CRC, and additional links can be found on our website, carepartnerscompass.transistor.com dot fm